Welcome to another episode of Maritime Health and Performance Chat. Today we've got a real jack of all trades in the form of a multi-sport athlete, a coach, a successful graduate of Masters in Physio, and a current practicing physiotherapist, my old high school wrestling coach, Nick Russell. So Nick, the floor is yours. Let's, uh, let's hear more about you. Hi, how's it going? Thanks for having me, Matt. It's great to see you. So I, uh, like Matt said, I, a uh, bit of a multi-sport athlete. Started wrestling in high school and a little bit uh, in my early 20s. Won a couple of provincial championships and medal a couple of nationals in the Greco-Roman category, if you're familiar with that. And then I uh, delved into some rugby, playing uh, with my club, HRFC, uh, for the last little bit. It's Halifax Rugby Football Club. And then, uh, yeah, then going to school at Dow, got my bachelor's of kinesiology at Dow. I managed to get on the dean's list there. And uh, while I was there, I was uh, started coaching wrestling back at my old high school, where Matt went to, Lockview High School, and had a pretty successful run there for four years did really well winning a couple uh provincial titles at least for the senior boys team which was really fun and then after that got into physio school at dow as well so i owe dow lots of money <laughs> and, and then i uh, completed my master's and became a registered physiotherapist a couple of years ago and i've been working at a uh, co-sport therapy since so i mean just being out in the uh i guess in the working world how has the first couple of years of experience as a practicing physiotherapist been it's good. I mean, school can only prepare you so much. I'm not sure what, the, I know you're looking into strength and conditioning and stuff like that, but you know, school is very, they're very structured and have to test you on things. And so the things that uh, every school seems to teach you some things. And once you get out of school, there's much more to learn. And sometimes what you learn in school might not be super valuable or super applicable to a clinical setting. And also having a live patient in front of you, not like a standardized patient, is very different because everyone has their own experiences, influence that's provide them. They don't have a standard sheet. And so it's uh, trying to keep up with the current research and um, apply it to clinically has been a bit of a challenge, but it's a fun challenge. I guess you're the second sort of practicing professional in a clinical type setting that I've had on. And I mean, depending on the uh, order I end up releasing these episodes and it might sound yeah. a little funny because you might come first, but I had Brett LeBlanc. I don't know if you oh. uh, remember Brett. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah. Who's a practicing osteopath. So one thing I, I asked Brett is, and it's something kind of, I guess I can relate to from the strength and conditioning world mm -hmm. is adherence. Cause especially, you know, when I was going through physio for my shoulder surgery way back in 2017 or geez, 2017, 2013, you'd go in and you'd get some treatment type stuff. So, yeah. so some electrical current type therapy or, yeah. they, you know, they would do some passive manipulation or anything like that, just trying to get some movement back in and some blood flow going. Yeah. But there was also several exercises that I was given to be doing every day to keep strengthening those little muscles. As far as adherence goes, do you find you have any issues with that? And if you do, do you have any kind of tips and tricks to guarantee better adherence with your clients? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm sure you know, once once you like being a patient and get into like some sort of health profession, like strength and conditioning, uh, I don't know what Brett told you, but uh, shoulder is a quite a common one that I see the clinic. And so, you know, passive modalities are good and make it feel good and stuff like that. But like you try to match and that's what I'm like trying to work on trying to help grow my practice is trying to like not just have standard run-of-the-mill exercises like with a TheraBand, do some external rotations and things like that, which is good starting out point, gets you feeling the muscle a little bit, you know, depends on what type of injury it is, but like after a while, not super exciting. And you know, most people, if they don't like it, you know, they're just not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's other things like around it. People have kids and stuff like that. It depends on where they, so it's best to try, like I try to like match what their goals are, at least try to make it sport specific. If they return to a sport or task specific, something that their goals towards, and then try to apply it to them. I feel like that's also where um, other health professionals that prescribe exercise like uh, physios or osteopaths can um, get a lot, a lot of knowledge and speak to strength and conditioning coaches, kind of help them spice up their exercise prescription, going into prescription ideas that, you know, or just better suited for the patient or, you know, more exciting for them. I think that's such a natural marriage between the, the physiotherapist and yeah. the strength and conditioning professional or a kinesiologist because you traditionally someone would go see you yeah. kind of right out of the gates, right out of the surgery. You would get that mobility back, that blood flow, promote as much healing as possible yeah. uh, and start to strengthen. And then, you know, as you kind of alluded to, then you have that kind of 
cooperation with a kinesiologist or a strength and conditioning professional who would then, you know, once you get that foundation back where they are yeah. able to perform some activities of daily living, you know, I would think the goal would be to try to funnel them into a dedicated program with some logical progression, like you said, specific to the client that would start to test the limits of those newly formed tissues or those newly repaired tissues. Because I mean, if someone just comes in and sees you every week or whatever, every two mm -hmm. weeks and only does those exercises in front of you, I mean, they're going to improve to a point, but the yeah. body needs to be over stimulated yeah. from that current sort of homeostasis, that current kind of setting point in order to adapt and improve those tissues. So I, I would think that's just such a, a great sort of, and, and also for you coming from a kin background, yeah. be such a good sort of marriage of two topics between the kind of strength conditioning training uh, and, you know, periodized training world and the, the physio world, the clinical side of it, and actually applying that to patients you see every day. Yeah, you're right. Nail on the head there. It's like, yeah, there's a plateau and like, you want to get stronger. So I try to quite like, to give an example of a simple exercise, if they're an athlete, like you can't get faster unless you run faster. And so same thing with like kind of rehab. So if it's like a shoulder, if you don't adapt or challenge it, the body's not going to adapt to that load. The body's super adaptable and stuff like that and responds to load. It's just, if, if you just kind of do the same thing over again, we're not going to get stronger. We're not going to see those gains or those improvements as quickly, especially normally we, as you see, like in the gym, stuff like that, if people when we go back to um, the uh, gym for New Year's resolutions, which is a great thing, people should keep on and hopefully stay there. But usually we see like a bunch of quick gains, like we're, increasing our weights very quickly and then we get to a point where the body is adapting kind of plateau and then we need to kind of that's when the consistency comes in where you just need a challenge and it has to be and then patience is a big thing too because it was to take about six weeks for muscle to grow yeah usually it's about you know you get those neuromuscular adaptations from the yeah exactly yeah and then you get six to eight you start actually seeing some tissue development yeah. So and say so we have in rehab, we, we're probably more at least if there's an acute injury, we're probably in that neuroadaptation mode where it just activate the muscle of the brains, provide more resources to that muscle. And then, you know, we see those quick, quick improvements. And then once we get into that point where we have that neural adaptation and then the long game where we're like takes another six to eight weeks to see that. And that's probably where most people depends on what their goal is, kind of probably get a little discouraged and impatient. Yeah, and that's definitely not uncommon, not just in the rehab world, but really in, in anything. In a lot of things, there's usually a, a quick climb up that learning curve, right? Sometimes people quickly, you know, learn the first couple things of, mm. of anything really, not just in, in physical activity, but in anything. They learn the first couple things, feel really proficient, have that great perceived self-efficacy, like they're really yeah. doing well at it. And then they hit that first plateau and it just drops them right off track. And then, you know, you see the vicious cycle of they get sort of sick of it, maybe a little bit yeah. burnt out of it because they're not seeing that same gain and adaptation at such a fast rate. And then they drop off, then they sort of detrain, they regress back to pre-training levels, pre-rehab physical capacity, or even if they're outside yeah. of the rehab setting. And then, you know, it's kind of a vicious cycle of then they see themselves back there. And then, you know, maybe they come back to start training again. They see those quick gains and then it's the excitement yeah. and then it's up and down and up and down. It's definitely a vicious cycle. And, and, and yeah. you know, having, like you said, specific training programs to people, right? Because uh, a huge thing about creating training programs is the principle of specificity is so important. Yeah. And that's awesome. I love that you mentioned that because I mean, once you make it specific to someone, you can then improve that intrinsic motivation, right? Instead of just yeah. saying, working out to look good in the mirror you can say how about you work out so you can run with your kids so you can yeah. go on hikes with your significant other all that kind of stuff right so it's definitely yeah. i love that you tailor that to be specific to each client yeah yeah that's uh, that's hard to do you know some are easier said than others and, and then depends how you bring across that message some agree with it some don't and so it's just also trying to like find that way to connect to them and everyone's a little bit different and so that's where the some of the dance comes is uh try to make it meaningful to them and try to motivate them as best you can to reach that goal awesome i mean part of this show is i like to preach that we do have something for everybody and you really are a jack of all trades with such a diverse background moving on kind of to the coaching side of things so i sure. remember when 
the first time I would have done any training for you, I was in grade eight. We, uh, the junior high team came over to train with you guys for a practice where it was kind of nearing the end of our school year. And right. it was just a nice sort of introduction to you and the rest of the, the high school team where mm -hmm. a lot of us were playing to transition to the next year. Yeah. But in my four years, you know, that core group of athletes that you had kind of before us and then that I was able to come up with. You know, we, we had a lot of fun. We, there was a lot of hard work, but we always really enjoyed it. And I found you had a really natural progression of the difficulty of and complexity of techniques and training methods and stuff. Can you just speak to kind of some of your, your coaching philosophy and coaching background? Because I mean, obviously you get some bad apples and people who aren't super into it and they came and went. But I mean, the core of us, like, you know, you yeah. had us bought in, like we had a lot of enjoyment that whole four years we were wrestling for you. That's a good question. I think I took a coaching course during my kin degree and that's my coaching philosophy. You have to see if I still those <laughs> notes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's good to have a, you know, a group of friends too. I mean, it makes it enjoyable and people you can talk to have the similar interests. And so that makes it easier. And that was a good group of kids that came through. And that was the first time I like, I had a direct influence on a group of kids. And um, it's the last group I had, they had, and we were in coaching transition and so they were kind of what you know people are kind of sometimes get stuck in the ways they think and the first thing that I taught to them and then it's hard to kind of break free from that so this is the first time I had Mike on my first um, influence in the group and so that was fun and it was a good group and uh, I think Dave McNutt was the high school coach, uh, junior high coach. Yep. And he did a good job of like getting kids into wrestling as well. And me and him had the same high school coach that had sort of different philosophy, civil background. That's Scott Elliott. So yeah, so my philosophy is, I don't know, try, try to just push people. Sometimes you have to get pushed out of your comfort zone and then realize how hard you can get pushed. And then just, uh, you know, just focus on one thing at task at a time, not try to um, think too long term in the future and have some set up some specific goals. Kids like learn a new technique, especially when they're new to a sport, learn a new technique and then set little goals as you get to tournaments, not get too focused on the results. Because that's something you can't really control who shows up to determine and who's going to be there, how many kids and who you're going to see and what weight class you're going to be in. So, yeah, I just try to make focus on that. And then once we get to like the big major tournaments is um, like what have you learned from previous tournaments and then apply it to when, you know, the results matter a little bit more. And that's where the, you know, the big show. And so that's why I always try to do and just try to focus on the long-term goal a little bit, but just make sure you're learning the most you can and don't be afraid to make too many mistakes. That's what practices for and then um and so if you came like last at one tournament and then okay what did you learn to try something new blah 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 which is great i love it when athletes always try something new if they messed up that's fine you know in the heat of moment it, as a coach you get a little bit frustrated but <laughs> but you come back to practice on like tuesday or wednesday whenever they had them and be able to apply and learn from it and see what you made and mistake and some kids are really good at it. Some take it offense to it. You just got to see what happens, I guess. But yeah, I think a bit, long story short is like, just don't worry about mistakes. Mistakes are going to happen. Just how you learn from mistakes. And that's how everyone's going to really learn. And try to break habits doing the same thing over and over again. It's trying to get outside that comfort zone and push yourself a little bit. And that's, I guess, sort of what my uh, coaching philosophy was. Awesome. And I mean, you and Dave were both very good at steering, you know, very young, impressionable kids who easily, you know, got very excited into the sport of wrestling with the access to YouTube and everything, seeing big five point throws and everything like that. Yeah. Dave were both really good at having a natural progression to the techniques you guys showed week to week yeah. and steering athletes away from, you know, Hey, can we do this move? And you're very, you know, very upfront, no beat around the bush, very transparent, which I mean, as a coach, it's great for um, inducing buy-in to a program, but you guys are both really great at being straight up with your athletes saying, you know, listen, this isn't a great move. It's going to work right now because you guys have all just started. Some people, this is their first year wrestling. Some of you guys are still very new to the sport. The move will work at some of these low level tournaments, but very easy yeah. to deal with, very easy to defend. It might be flashy, but the risk to reward ratio is just terrible. And you were great at kind of saying, you know, hey, let's keep focus on those goals. Let's stay to task. And those kind of flashy moves fell to the wayside. And whenever, you know, we came up by our opponents in tournaments, it was, you know, by the second or third kind of matches, it was pretty easy to work around those flashy moves and just stick to the basics because basics win matches. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, basic totally with matches. I think you always had those flashy moves to kind of keep in the back pocket, you know, always look good. Yeah, it was good. And especially like as you get harder and harder, like especially if you want to go continue on, there's a couple of guys that kind of did more outside of high school and that was your goal. That's some of those moves that 
work against someone who's ever wrestled before, wasn't a natural athlete, or you just end up being just into puberty ahead of them. Essentially, uh, those are going to work against them, but like what you're learning. And then once you get to the high end stuff, anyone that uh, they're not, it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. And, exactly. so, and, you're, and then what, once you stop your one move or one technique, like what else do you got? So are some people kind of fall off the wayside a little bit because, you know, they reach to a certain level and then that's it. <laughs> get frustrated and no one really likes to lose. Especially <laughs> in wrestling, which it's pretty, uh, it's pretty hard to lose. You take a lot of onus yeah. on yourself to lose. Especially compared so. to, you know, say team sports where, you know, you can have the best game of your life and your team still loses. At least you yeah. can kind of have that in the back of your mind say, you know what, I, if, you know, I have a performance mentality and say, I had a great performance say there's a lot of good I can take from that. And then you get the flip side of that where you could play terribly, but yeah. you still get the win so you can kind of take that in the back of your mind like you know what yeah, we won yeah. today i'm going to come back better next time but in uh in wrestling it was just you and yeah. your opponent and if you weren't on that day against someone yeah. who was you know equal or even better than you showed immediately yeah yeah exactly you're right and then it all comes down to like your prep and then so it's all about the work in between tournaments or matches that kind of and how you prepare yourself for matches and how you prepare yourself after matches which you can take into like a rehab setting as well always shows and you can always tell who put the work in and who kind of did sort of or kind of didn't do anything at all and that really shows it's funny that you just mentioned in the rehab setting because i was just thinking about another question to ask you earlier you had mentioned from your coaching background that it was about sort of showing people their limits making them comfortable with being uncomfortable and kind of pushing those limits uh yeah and I was going to ask, you know, do you, do you find that you've taken some of that mentality and, you know, tailored that specifically to your clients of finding ways to show them their own limits and that they very much have the capacity to surpass them should they want to do that? Yeah, I try to. And, you know, it's uh, with depends on what it is. And especially with pain, it's such a uh, tricky thing. So many factors can, can factor into a person's perception of pain. And so, yeah, and people get a little discouraged, especially when it's like an overuse injury, like an Achilles tendinopathy or some plantar heel pain or yeah, patella tendinopathy or anything like that. When there's pain and like, oh, I just shouldn't do anything. It's like, well, that's what we can stand right now. So we have to back off a little bit and they know. And so it's a good thing that's telling us this is where our limit is. And um, so we have to dial back a little bit. And just now we know where our goal is or what our next step is and to kind of build ourselves back up to there so we can, once we get introduced to that new loading, our body is adapted to it and it's not going to seem as threatening or cause any kind of inflammatory process or any kind of pain or discomfort. That's fantastic. I mean, you know, you've already spent all those years coaching and in school and mm. stuff. So, I mean, the more you can pull certain things you learned in one part of your life and experience yeah. part of your life and bring them into another part, that's just kind of already putting you a little bit ahead than everyone else that, that you can kind of apply those concepts that you've already learned to something new or to something else, which I guess isn't that new anymore that you've been a couple of years practicing. I guess on the subject of influences, and this goes for, you know, whenever I'm working with some athletes or anything like that, but it's always easier to make recommendations, adaptations, any sort of programming when you've actually participated in that thing. Do you find that your experience as uh, an athlete as well influences any of your practices, any of your decision-making or programming or anything like that for your clients? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that actually. Because I always give my answer, especially when they're a young athlete, well, I, I, tr I treat someone when it comes to a young athlete compared to someone, you know, a bit older and like, like mid twenties and above is, uh, <laughs> I give a professional advice and my athletic advice. <laughs> <laughs> and so professionally, I always get a pain like, yeah, I mean, this game's not important or this match or this race is not too important. So if you kind of like, we can wait a little bit, we can, you know, come back. We want to make sure we're competing at like a highest level, but at the same time as an athlete, you know, that you never really hardly competing at a hundred percent. So I always um, tell them I get my professional advice. It's always this, but an athlete, I, I always said, I probably would myself, but again, but what, and then I explain, well, you know, what costs and like how important it is. And like, depends on like, yeah, how important that is. And the big deal uh, with younger athletes, I try to say like, you know, it's kind of telling you it's a little bit too much right now. It depends on what their symptoms are and how they're experiencing it. But like at the same time, always like, always try to bet on yourself. Like, 
if you're good, especially you're kind of looking towards like a provincial team or like that, um, like if you're good, you're going to get noticed, you know, one competition not going to be the be and the end all, although it might seem like that in that way, but um, just always kind of bet on yourself and just try to look after yourself because that's, again, another good habit to look into is just trying to make sure that you're taking care of your body as the best you can. That's such a good kind of mindset to pass on to these clients that you will bet on yourself because as much as you can give your professional opinion, you can give your opinion as a former athlete as well. No one knows what's going on inside your body, how pain is being perceived, how much kind of strain or anything you might have during a certain movement or under a certain load, then mm -hmm. yourself, right? You're the yeah. only one who knows kind of that to a T, what's going on in your head, what's going on in your body, are you stressed, are you anxious, are you sore, tight, hurt, feeling yeah. fresh, right? Like, so that's awesome that you kind of pass on that kind of bet on yourself because it's really important to have someone be honest with theirself and know what's going on because I mean, the more you learn to do that, the more you can kind of pick and choose those more opportune or less opportune times to say, you know what, I'm going to sit this tournament out. I'm going to let this heal, or I'm going to get this extra training day in because I'm feeling fresh or anything like that. So I love that you're passing that uh, sentiment on to them. Yeah. Pitch education is huge. You know, when they're adults, they know their bodies. Like you said, you can give them the information and you just let them, you just tell them like, personally, I probably would, but does that mean you should? And then just give them the information and uh, leave it up to them, you know, patient autonomy. As long as you know the risk and rewards and all that stuff, and um, they can make their own decision. You know, the young athletes, you have to make a little bit more of a, a dance because things are not as big as they, I find. I'm just reflecting on myself. Things are never as big as they seem. And yeah, just bet on yourself. Just be okay with taking some time if you need to and just listen to your body. Another thing I took from that too is continuing on sort of how I mentioned that you were very straightforward, didn't beat around the bush with us as athletes. It sounds like you kind of take the same approach with your clientele, you know, and like you said, give them a the bit of that autonomy, discuss with them what you're doing and why. And I mean, that definitely improves that buy-in, that adherence. And I mean, that goes as deep as any literature as far mm. as, you know, coaching or leading or trying to induce behavior changes in someone, giving them that bit of autonomy, even if it's just a perception that they have an input into the, the program that they then have to perform seems to really improve buy-in and actually improve the the chance that they adhere to that program as strictly as possible yeah that's what i try to do sometimes it doesn't always work sometimes i kind of give a lot of verbal garbage and and stuff like that so that's something i'm still trying to work on is uh getting a little more involved and but yeah a bit more of a focus on that and make adapt adaptations to what they need to do but as a therapist only a couple of years out it's 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 easier said than done but yeah yeah, there's probably so many nuances to dealing with your clientele as patients, especially that you would see so many coming in a in an injured state, in a vulnerable yeah. state, that yeah. um, it's probably different from patient to patient. I couldn't even imagine the the nuances in trying to create these programs and induce that buy-in and try to facilitate that rehabilitation of these clients. Yeah, I mean, some people come in and they have back pain for like 20 years and they've been told do this, this, and this, and nothing's really changed. And so I suck living like something like chronic back pain I and mean, tried everything. And so, yeah, so it is kind of patient dependent and it's, uh, and getting to show what they can do. Sometimes they have a little bit of fear of movement because just sometimes it feels like everything hurts and it's just almost like walking with a pebble in your shoe for like 10 years. And like how annoying would that be or how exhausting would that be? Yeah, it's like, you know, how waterfalls are formed. There's a, that little drip, that little trickle that slowly mm -hmm. wears down the rock and eventually it creates the big opening. You know, there's that, that bit of pain that might not seem bad at first, but after living with it for umpteen years, it eventually wears away probably at a person. And after going to see maybe numerous physios or numerous clinicians and doing different treatments and not having much luck, it's probably pretty tough. Even when you get someone who's made the decision to come see you after all those years, uh, it's probably pretty tough to actually get them to stick to a program. And I would think you'd almost have to take a little baby step sometimes, or like you said, keeping a program very specific to them. Yeah, uh, that's right. That's uh, banging the head and like, yeah, the drip you talk about, you know, like nothing could have changed. Like they could have like MRI and imaging and stuff like that. And nothing has really changed. And like you've seen multiple different clinicians, different health professionals. And when sometimes people say things that contradict to each other, so there's this conflicting information. So it makes it confusing to them. And so they try to kind of simplify that kind of stuff and just kind of make it work what they're experiencing and challenge them a little bit, let them know that movement's okay. And as long as you keep on moving, things will feel better. If you at least can focus a little more on function, less on 
how the pain is feeling and just kind of focus on some function and just take that kind of be your bit of a goal if, if lifting 20 pounds of groceries is kind of bugging so that's that's your goal and let's start working towards that even though your pain might stay the same but if you're kind of doing more that definitely can have a big benefit towards them as well that's awesome. You mentioned earlier about kind of going through physio school that there's a little bit of disconnect between the actual practicing clinician and some of the stuff you learned in school. For anyone listening that maybe has aspirations to be physios or is currently in school or even done school, but maybe missed some of this or haven't had the experience to sort of fill in the gaps in their knowledge yet. What would be some suggestions you have for them or maybe some areas they should focus on, some areas maybe they should go do some independent learning that maybe you found school didn't quite prepare you for um, or anything like that they should carefully pay attention to or, you know, maybe focus their resources on more or less? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a, that's a tough one. I mean, if you're in school right now, get your degree. That's <laughs> school's tough. It must be hard to teach a, a curriculum more like that when something's so like a rehab process is so fluid. So nothing's ever black and white. And uh, yeah, so my advice is yeah, do some independent learning and um, uh, be open. Just find your interest in something in and study and try to keep up. You know, internet is a great resource. And then if you're on any social media, there's some good people to follow that are kind of keeping up. Um, but when you follow them a little bit too much, you know, especially when you're first out of school, it's like, oh, everything I learned was bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now? And then you have a patient in front of you. It's like, I could do this, but your research is showing, like, am I really doing that? Which is very hard. And so it's got to be open mind that things are going to change. And that that's science. And that's a hard thing to do is you learn one thing. And then five years later, once you get out of school, it's uh, not quite true or not backed up by a lot of science. So just keep learning is essentially what it is and just be open and which is easier said than done. You know, everyone has their biases and stuff like that. And yeah, like I said in 10 years, like what I think is I tell my patient now might be different in two to three years or 10 years. And so just gotta be okay with that. Yeah, it's super important that continual education and always being updated on current best practices, because like you said, it's funny that in the span of a couple of years, it can change drastically. They can be a huge paradigm shift depending on what the research is saying, depending on your experience with certain populations, mm. uh, anything like that. I guess that segues into really well to one of our main questions. What do you feel that you're doing uh, to stand out and sort of get ahead in your field? Um, that's a good question. I love talking about myself. <laughs> uh, always humble. I, always. Yeah. <laughs> um, I try to be myself. I think that's a big thing is try to keep a little bit humor in there. Luckily I work in a nice clinic with that, um, very collaborative and have some good resources there and then kind of look at the whole person, not just treat the person as like a machine, which human beings are quite different than a machine and try to use like the more, apply a little more biosocial model. Just understand that everyone's got a little bit of experiences and fears and preconceived notions and try to apply to that and hopefully make a difference. That's awesome. I mean, like none of that is revolutionary stuff. It almost goes back to kind of how you coached us. It wasn't always the, the flashy highlight reel moves that worked. It's sometimes the answer's right under your nose. You know, don't overthink it. Just be consistent. Just keep putting in that work. Keep those programs uh, specific and keep learning with your patients and that success and that you know, improved quality of life for your clients will, will come. Yeah, eventually it's, it's easier to send than done. It's hard. And it's hard to stay patient as a therapist as well. That's something I'm working on is uh, not, you know, be stuck in that quick, quick things. And, you know, sometimes it does take a long time and you got to be patient is, is pretty key as well. <laughs> I guess that would be something you would almost have to instill in your clients as well, because even as hard as the patients would be for you to not be able to see and enjoy in the improved capacity of your clients, probably even worse so if they're not seeing quick improvements uh, on their end, then it's probably even more difficult for them. And, and you know, that, that patience becomes even more important. Right on. That's completely right. Yeah. I still that confidence and just let know sometimes it takes a little bit while and everyone responds differently. As a therapist, it's easier said than done. Uh, I think everything in life is usually easier said than done. Yeah. Um, I guess getting to something very topical, but yeah. how has the current global pandemic affected you and what sort of considerations and modifications have you had to make as a practicing clinician to continue to provide that service to your patients? Well, that's easy. First part is crazy. Like, there was no sports for, for yeah. so long. Yeah. <laughs> so 
you know, uh, gyms were closed and a lot of people were active. And so everyone's kind of in their little bunker. And, you know, myself included was uh, gone to that uh, little shelter that you made for yourself. Uh, and that's hard. And, you know, gyms being closed and people don't have enough clients and enough, uh, enough resources, like not going to be able to go to the gym. And so like what do you have at home? So a big part is trying to make modifications like at home workouts with very minimal equipment, which you can do, you know, makes the thing louder and you have to be a little bit more creative. And then um, really made sure that sort the whole and like, at least in the field of perspective, I'm sure it's the same thing with strength and conditioning and other health professionals is uh, you have to um, make yourself pandemic proof essentially is so yeah, trying, trying to build up a online presence is kind of, is kind of huge. Yeah, because I guess part of physio is you don't necessarily just inherit a client base. You have to put yourself out there and advertise yourself and people have to come to you and then you build those relationships and hopefully build those those loyal lifelong clients. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, that's, that's right on. Yeah. What, uh, if you don't mind my asking, what was it like kind of when things started to open back up again? Did you have some returning clients and was there any sort of regression in their conditions or cases? And was it sort of difficult to get back on the tracks or was it pretty seamless that people were pretty rare to go? Uh, yeah, I think some people were cautious, which makes sense, especially when we were allowed to leave our houses. That was, I think some people didn't trust it too much. <laughs> um, I just looked going through our uh, schedule. So it took a little while for, for myself to get going, which made sense because, you know, people weren't doing much and usually people are not proactive with their therapy or getting back in shape. They're more reactive. And so we had to wait for all those like tenopathies and plantar heel pain conditions come up once people got a little bit active. Well, uh, massage got in our clinic booked up real quick. <laughs> I think a lot of people were looking for the massage first thing once things open up. Yeah, some were pretty good. Like if you're a runner, like that uh, pandemic didn't too much. I mean, if you had some races canceled, but runners were going to run no matter what. And so they did a pretty good job of keeping things in check. It's those, uh, you know, those uh, athletes that didn't have any competition or couldn't practice. Um, you know, there's going to be those overuse injuries. Uh, for some reason, I saw a lot of ankle sprains the first like month or two back. That was quite interesting. I guess maybe after all that time being sedentary and inactive, you lose that neuromuscular control. You lose that sort of timing and that synchronization of that firing of the neural drive. And maybe those little stabilizer muscles aren't working like they used to when you come back from being in an isolated state for so long that, you know, you're predisposed. Well, yeah, exactly. It made sense there. Yeah. I mean, like putting yourself in the flat position is quite different than doing like an old home workout with, you know, if you don't not even, especially going to practices or have like a full up practice or training session like you said like yeah that neural adaptation is quite not there and to like make a cut or um, those explosive movements aren't quite up to snuff yet and so yeah I mean that's where generally those kind of injuries are going to happen there that's awesome and one thing uh, you, you know usually we wrap up after that final question but one thing you said was people are usually reactive to their problems and not proactive do you have much experience in kind of almost the the I guess quote unquote prehab setting uh, that's a good question yeah i love i think i'm quite interested in the prehab i think we're in our society and healthcare system we're quite a reactive thing just that's how our like our general health care system is i mean you look at like some i know it's a little bit off topic but uh you know like comorbidities like um stroke heart attack and all that stuff we don't treat that until we have those conditions but save the healthcare a lot of money if we just kind of exercise a little bit more or help in uh, you know prepare ourselves a lot of that stuff we can adapt by having a a bit of healthier lifestyle. I mean, there's some things we can't control, but we can definitely reduce the risk. Yeah. And so that was a bit of a side topic. It's kind of one that I've been stewing on for a bit. Yeah. Uh, so prehab's a bit hard, you know, uh, so we had to get past that mindset of, oh, we just won't go to physio until, or get strength and conditioning coach. I think people don't use strength and conditioning enough, or at least around here anyways, to prepare ourselves for, for that. So I'm quite interested. Uh, I'm quite getting quite interested in um, hamstring prevention injuries. That's something that, I don't know, for some reason just kind of like sticks with me. Can they kind of like running sport athletes, you know, hamstrings are one of the most common ones and be able to build a nice little um, program to help reduce the risk of those athletes that get quite susceptible or get them quite frequently to a hamstring injuries. That's something I'm quite uh, interested in uh, studying a little bit more. 
Yeah, mm. that's a big one in, in power sports. You know, anything from football to wrestling to yeah. to combat sports to hockey. You know, where any sport that you need that quick explosion, quick stop start, you, those hamstrings turn on so quick. And uh, if you try to do sort of like an isometric force producing task, they're usually about one third the strength I want to say of your quads. So the demand yeah. is still high. The glutes are they're working along with the glutes for that hip extension as well as that yeah. knee flexion but they're so important and integral in so many movements and used in so many movements that they are mm. under so much stress all the time that, you know, it makes sense that you would see people that are highly susceptible to them. And, you know, kind of speaking to those ankle sprains, especially after being so sedentary and less active and people who don't have home gyms can't load those muscles and those connective mm. tissue structures adequately to strengthen those structures. So, I mean, it, it, that seems like a very topical area that would benefit a lot of athletes sort of prehabbing hamstrings. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, just everyone comes in and says, like, oh, my hamstrings are tight. And then, like, what do you do for them? Like, well, I stretch all the time. Or they don't, but it doesn't matter. But, you know, another thing I was, like, talking about stretching, like, what are we doing? What's, like, is that preparing you for your uh for your sport you know you just stop back and think about it like is a passive stretch is that going to prepare you for decelerating that quad or that knee extension depends on you know how strong you are where you are in your sport like how much force that requires to like decelerate or that force the quad produces your hamstring has to decelerate that and so is a passive stretch gonna do that no <laughs> <laughs> It's funny you kind of briefly talked about coaches kind of coaching a certain way just because they were coached that way. That's almost yeah. like sort of passive stretching, right? It's like everyone was told for years, even from I remember from elementary school gym class, oh, you got to stretch, you got to hold it for 30 seconds, all that yeah. stuff. But especially yeah. for um, very powerful, explosive speed sports or high force generating sports, all the research shows that passive stretching, like really uh, trying to extend the length of that muscle well past what it really what you need within your sport yeah. or what your sport requires actually decreases the ability to output force decreases the output uh, the ability mm -hmm. to output power and, and decreases sort of that timing that neural drive timing of how fast mm -hmm. the muscle can contract and like you said in a in one of the main functions decelerate after a rapid forceful knee extension um, yeah. And what people don't realize is passive stretching is not what we thought it was. Like it actually decreases a lot of those really important functions that we need to meet those high uh, force and power demands. Right. Bang on. Um, yeah. You know, you see some benefit, no benefit or de decrease in performance kind of fluctuates, but doesn't really add much. And then also like when you're stretching, are you actually stretching the muscle? And then like, cause muscle fibers don't change unless load is producing them. There's no real load producing on the hamstring when you hold a stretch for 30 seconds. And so that's something that I kind of hopefully trying to work towards and kind of changing some people's um, perception about stretching and what are we really doing with it? I mean, stretching might feel good. If it feels good, do it. it feels good, it might feel good after you compete or anything like that or in the day, just kind of help, you know, center yourself, I guess, and like kind of reduce the stressors that have been put onto you. But like you're talking about kind of a performance aspect especially as a young kid, yeah, what are we doing? And is that the best thing for you? And so that's kind of a, uh, yeah, like I said, like that's something I was like quite interested in and hopefully may kind of sh help shift the narrative around stretching. Geez, with all the clinicians I have, I should almost do a mobility round table. I mean, I think we could be here all day talking about uh, different modalities and kind of getting rid of some of the old school methodologies as far as increasing range of motion and uh, mobility yeah. goes. So uh, yeah. maybe I'll be bugging you again for another, another round, uh, a repeat guest, friend of the podcast. <laughs> That'd be awesome. But yeah, like, like I said earlier, Nick, I don't want to keep you too long because I know everyone likes to enjoy their weekends. You're a hardworking physio through the week. So uh, I just wanted to thank you for volunteering your time today. And I guarantee that people who listen to this, whether they are a uh, an aspiring physio or looking to get in some other sort of clinical practice or just a student, an athlete, a coach, mm -hmm. whatever, there's definitely something to be taken from, like I said, your jack of all trades background. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just before we wrap up here, yeah. do you have any projects or, or programs or anything you'd like to highlight? Obviously, um, please reiterate the clinic you work at and maybe how people can find you if they're interested in, uh, in getting some physio done for anything. Yeah, I, I work at uh, Co-Sport Therapy in Dartmouth, a great little clinic right on Banook Lake. You can reach, you can go to co-sporttherapy.ca to book an appointment. Yeah, try and look, 
like, you know, a uh, little project trying to increase some online resources and stuff like that to pandemic proof and give some people some information that they could use and maybe don't need a clinic. Maybe they'll need to come into the clinic and just get some resources from there. And hopefully that helps. Yeah. And just continuing education. Um, learning online it seems to be the way to go right now until the foreseeable future. So just trying to get into um, learn as much as I can on specific body parts. Hamstring is a big thing and looking into some shoulder and hip courses as well. That's awesome. And, you know, again, I can never say enough that how important that continual lifelong learning is. And it's so great to hear that uh, that's such a core value for you. And it sounds like your patients are in great hands. Uh, and again, Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, that's all we got for this, this week on uh, Maritime Health and Performance Chat. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me.